This is TWIS. This Week in Science, episode number 631, recorded on Wednesday, August 9th, 2017. How does your science grow? Hey everyone, I am Dr. Kiki and tonight on This Week in Science, we are going to fill your heads with learning bees and Tom Merritt. But first, TWIST is supported by listeners like you. We thank you for your support. We really couldn't do it without you. Disclaimer, disclaimer, disclaimer. Humans, by far the most accomplished category of creature on the planet Earth when it comes to certain things, harnessing, multiplying, and applying energy to do work. Humans are good at that. They succeed at technology where other creatures seem uninclined to endeavor. In this, above all other actions, they are most successful. Humans make tools and learn to fly, which is clever, but only casually so when compared to a crow, which can do both of these hands-free. Humans domesticated cat and dog to be subservient companion species for whom the humans toil to provide food and shelter and pick up after asking for nothing in return, as if it is they in charge of the situation. Humans, special effects in film and video seem fantastical feats until you see in real time and in reality the shape-shifting, color-changing cuttlefish's skill at illusion. Humans can tell, tell a good tale, though there are better bards amongst the beluga. Termite mound architecture dwarfs even the tallest skyscraper by scale, and not even the fastest fast rapper can keep pace with a kookaburra. And these are but a few examples. Humans are not nearly the all-accomplishing planetary firsters they believe themselves to be. They act as if all category of accomplishment belongs to them simply because they refuse to invite any other species to the competition. Though there is one accomplishment, the humans have made that all the creatures of the earth are at once thankful and envious of. This Week in Science, coming up next... I want to know what's happening, what's happening, what's happening this week in science. What's happening, what's happening, what's happening this week in science. Good science to you, Kiki and Blair. And the good science to you too, Justin and Blair and Tom Merritt. Oh, hello. Hi, and Hi, everyone else out there. Hey, how are you doing? <laughs> Don't mind me. I just slipped in when you weren't looking, Justin. <laughs> yeah, just when you're not paying attention, Tom Merritt comes over to join the podcast. That's right. Happy day of science, everyone. Welcome to another episode of This Week in Science. Today we have a fabulous show ahead, if I do say so myself. It just looks wonderful. We have lots of science news. I have new stories about dark matter, neutrinos, and a reason to sleep as if you needed another one. I love sleeping. And we are joined by Tom Merritt, who is going to talk with us about science and fiction in the same conversation. (laughs) (laughs) It's going to be fabulous. And I will be introducing him a little bit more in just a few minutes. But Justin, what did you bring for the show? Uh, I've got some ancient ape skull that's worth talking about. And... uh... (laughs) <laughs> How many doctors were paid to prescribe opiates to people? Wait, how many? That's I guess the- more than on my two hands. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I'll add my feet toes in too. And Blair, what is in the animal corner? I brought intelligent, indispensable, incredible insects. That's it. Oh, okay. I thought you were going to go somewhere else with that. All right. Nope. Insects. Nope. Because they're so incredible. They can take up the entire animal corner. There's, oh, there's those invertebrates. a lot out there, so it's pretty cool. Yeah. Biomass dwarfs humanity. Yes. Doesn't it? Doesn't it, though? All right. The show is looking pretty good. And everyone, as we jump into our new favorite segment of the show, I want to remind you that you can subscribe to Twists. The Twist Podcast on iTunes, on the in the Google Play podcast portal, 
on Stitcher, in Spreaker, and in TuneIn. Just search the interwebs, or you can just go to twist.org and look for our RSS feed if that's what you're into. You can find us on YouTube and Facebook. Look for This Week in Science. Remember, twist.org, though. It's where it all comes from. Now it is time for What Has Science Done for Me Lately? And we got a letter from Minion Fernando Lopez Haro. And Fernando wrote in to say, besides science, my other passion in life has always been painting. Recently, I've picked up my old oil paints and brushes and have profited of, on hours upon hours of the soothing application of layers of paint in a canvas, letting my creativity unwind. At the same time, it got me thinking about how this activity was done in the past. For instance, pigments and dyes used to achieve vibrant and intense hues that really stuck to the canvas were often obtained from rather hazardous materials. Many well-known examples include lead for whites, arsenic for greens, and mercury for reds, which were essential to obtain a long-lasting hue, but were also critically toxic. And in most cases, the reasons behind the debilitating conditions, conditions were not even well understood and thus couldn't be cured, nor could they be treated. Fortunately for artists today, toxic toxicity is one of the main concerns in the production of modern supplies, whether that's paint, solvents, lacquers, or tools alike. It was science which led to the identification of these compounds as the culprits of such a diminished quality of life, consequence of prolonged and improper exposure to noxious substances. Moreover, science has allowed both the discovery and the synthesis of less harmful alternatives than those compounds used in the past. Today, painting is, for the most part, a no longer life-threatening activity, which I can enjoy while listening to the reassuring and constant progress of science delivered by your amazing show. Thank you. And this is Fernando Lopez Har Haro. Painting, so, no longer painting. a life-threatening pastime. No longer a life-threatening pastime, no. And he went on to say, thank you for such an inspiring, entertaining effort to inform and spread the word about the wonders of what humans are able to do through careful and methodical thought. You make it seem like an easy task, but making a podcast like yours is a feat that requires extensive amounts of consistency, patience, organization, commitment, and most of all, passion. Thanks for being an inspiration to myself as an aspiring scientist about to finish my undergraduate studies as a chemical engineer and equal, eager to pursue research-oriented opportunities out there. Listening to you every week fuels my hope that humans are capable of changing our collective future through the power of science. Keep up the good work. Greetings from Mexico. Thank you, Fernando. Thank you that's, so much. Yeah, and that's really good to know because I... I, I paint but I, I just assumed it was all still highly toxic i had no idea <laughs> <laughs> not so toxic anymore thanks to science fernando thank you so much for writing in and remember everyone out there we need you to write in to us to let us know what science has done for you or does for you week after week or what has it done lately leave us a message on our facebook page facebook.com slash this week in science and we want to fill this segment of the show with something from one of you every single week. So keep writing in so I can schedule reading your letters. I do really appreciate this part of the show. Thank you so much. And now, and now, drum roll. <laughs> I'd like to introduce Tom Merritt. He's an award-winning independent tech podcaster, and he's the host of regular tech news and information shows. You may have heard his voice on Sword and Laser a science fiction and fantasy podcast and book club with Veronica Belmont. He also, every day of the week, Monday through Friday, puts out the Daily Tech News Show. Daily, right? You get that? Every day? -ish. About tech news, yeah. Yeah. Covering the most important tech issues of the day with the smartest minds in technology. He's got good friends, I tell you. And he's also working on Current Geek with Scott Johnson, Cord Killers with Brian Brushwood, and he does top five for Tech Republic. And then somewhere in there, among all these podcasts and periscopes, he writes books also. It's pretty <laughs> awesome. This is why I listen to podcasts at two and a quarter speed. I'm doing all this other stuff. Which is funny when the show started, because I've been listening to This Week in Science for years and years, and I'm like, wow, Justin's disclaimer seems a little longer than usual. It's good. And then <laughs> the music started, and I was like, 
wow, the music seems a little down tempo. <laughs> I realized you're at normal speed right this now. This is real life, normal speed. Yeah. <laughs> I wonder how many people out there do listen to us at increased rates of listening. You know, I bet it's a I pretty good percentage. I think we're very different. <laughs> I, yeah. I think, I think, I think uh, there's just in order to make sure my stories are more clear in the future, I'm going to talk <laughs> like this for my portion and segment. Then I'll have to go to three speed. Oh, boy. Yeah, I already feel like people tell me I talk way too fast. That's got to be out of control. Yeah. Blair, you sound like a chipmunk. You have a lot of energy. <laughs> a lot of energy. That's right. So, Tom, tell us a bit about uh, about your different podcasts. Um, we've we I have been on the Daily Tech News show before. And, and we'll be again short, shortly. And, yeah. and we'll be again soon. Yeah. Uh, but what got you in? I mean, you started a long time ago working on the tech news. How did you get into doing this? Yeah. I mean, the short answer is I was working at CNET in 2004 when podcasting was becoming a thing. And I started, it wasn't the only one, but I was one of the people agitating to do a CNET podcast. One thing led to another, and Molly Wood and myself uh, were doing a weekly 10-minute tech podcast called Buzz Out Loud, Mm -hmm. which three months later had become a daily 40-minute tech podcast. And after I left CNET, I did a show called Tech News Today for Twit. And then after I left Twit, I started doing my own show, Daily Tech News Show. So I've, I've been doing it ever since. But why tech? Um, what draws I got, you to it? I've always been into technology. I have always been uh, fascinated with make computers in particular, like making them do things. One of the one of my earliest experiences was with the TI ninety nine four A doing basic programming and making uh, games happen. And then I programmed software for my own computer baseball league on a Commodore sixty four. And then fast forward through a lot of other things. Uh, when I started working for ZDTV in nineteen ninety nine. I was able to get into coverage of technology uh, and and working on the website for that. And uh, one thing led to another, and here I am. It's just, it's always fascinated me what you can do, the things, especially on the internet, that have changed so that you don't need big, expensive equipment that you used to need when I was a kid. You can do it with, I mean, it used to be a laptop or a desktop, and now you can do it with a tiny little square piece of glass in your pocket. Oh, yeah. I'm, all, I'm constantly amazed by these really fast computers that we have, these computers that can take pictures and phone calls, and they do it all, and it's in your pocket. So you're, but you've all, reporting on technology and constantly seeing what's new and what's coming up, I find this for science sometimes, you end up on like the bleeding edge of discoveries, the bleeding edge of the technology. How do you bring yourself back to relate to what everybody wants to know about what's important? Yeah, I do a couple of error corrections of my own biases uh, in picking my stories. One of them is to look at like algorithmically generated lists like Google News or Reddit uh, to also look at, and we have our own subreddit for Daily Tech News Show, so I can get it straight from the listeners, to also look at more of an editorially controlled thing like tech meme, and then just pay attention to the audience, talk, you know, have have avenues for for the folks who are listening and watching the show to talk about what they're interested in and kind of get a sense of what they respond to and and what causes them to think and talk and send emails and that sort of thing. Yeah, what kind of things do people respond to the most? Like, what what kind of stories do they kind of go, oh, that's exciting and interesting, and I want to know more about that? It's usually two kinds of things. It's a theoretical thing that hasn't been beaten to death, right? So one example was the trolley problem. Uh, when we, we started talking about the trolley problem as it relates to self-driving cars, which is how do you program the car to make the decision where it's going to kill somebody no matter what it does? And what are the mm-hmm. ethics behind that? And, and what, what is the proper way to develop that? And we had a lot of people really get into it. Doesn't matter. They're never going to, they're going to hit that problem. And then other people like, yes, but even if it only happens one out of a thousand times, we need to plan for it. So it's those highly theoretical things like that, or really super practical, like, I have this phone and it's broken. How can I fix it? Or, or you know, what, why is my device not doing the thing that I want to do? Should I get this particular smart speaker versus that one? 
Uh, by the by the way, the uh, the the trolley problem has been solved in cars. It has. Yeah, they they'll just hit the brakes in both scenarios. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the default. You're, you're on that side. Of, you're on that side of the argument, and there were the a lot of people on that side of the, the argument. Of like, it's not a problem. There isn't a yeah. problem. There isn't a problem. The car actually, because the car is going to hit the brakes. It's yeah. got four. They're all going to have forward, forward. But then, what if the brakes fail? <laughs> right. Well, then the brakes fail. Brakes fail and brakes fail. The but brakes fail and it can go left or right. <laughs> it won't. It'll just the brake. This is going to have backup. The emergency brake. This is like a week of DTNS right here. It'll with cut people going, the engine no, and don't shift hard. Yeah, but it won't. It won't. It just won't. It just won't happen. Oh my goodness! Well, that, yeah. that's the thing, though. That's the thing, and, and I'm I'm still picturing that moment with the self-driving car where I'm 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 stuck in traffic because I'm the last one to adapt in any technology, <laughs> and this so I'm so- still driving my car, and I'm looking to the left, and there's an empty car there taking little Johnny's. They're gonna go pick up little Johnny from school, and there's an empty car over here, and they're gonna go pick up groceries at the store because they put their order in online, and the car just has to show up, and they're gonna throw it in the trunk, and the car in front of me is getting an oil change, and the car over there is running errands, and and I'm the only human left on the road, and I'm in gridlock. Yeah, because everybody else's car is out there too. Well, and you're in the humans, the only lane that's, that human drivers are allowed to in be the in. Human lane. So you can't even change. Oh, well, that would be anymore. great if I get my own lane and it's all worth it. Then I'm not yeah. stuck in traffic and I can go. But it's a shared <laughs> lane. Sorry. <laughs> I think it, I think it's interesting. This really highlights how there are so many different sides to conversations. And so I think it's really wonderful to be able to have these conversations. We have them all the time with our own audience about, you know, what are the different perspectives. Some people are like, oh, I like Justin. I don't think there's a problem. Other people, yes, there is a problem. Well, so other people are in between. And it's just wonderful to see where, or, and, and to be able to highlight that in a, in a public conversational way. Yeah. And, and, and kind of further that conversation mm-hmm. and get people to, to, to decide what they think. I mean, I, I, th- I think there's too, too little of that going on. There's a lot of people out there wanting to tell you what you should think. There are not enough people telling you the things you need to know to make up your own mind about what mm-hmm. to think. Mm-hmm. I couldn't agree more. So do you think podcasting is helping to get uh, all of us independent podcasters? Do you, do you think it's helping to get more of the make up your own mind? I mean, I would like to think that- my show and your show are doing that. And I know there are other shows doing that, but it's, you know, it's like a screwdriver. It, it, if people use our shows for good, then, right. then it's great. But if they stab somebody with them, it's not so good. <laughs> ah, you were just stabbed by DTNS. Yeah. <laughs> well, but that's the great thing about podcasting, right? Is that we're not beholden to large corporate sponsors in the same way TV shows are. And so we can tell it exactly like it is and not worry about upsetting a lobbyist or an oil company or a tech but, but we company would like or whoever. To we would like to be conflicted with our stories, right? Wouldn't you love to go and it's like, oh, I got another Monsanto story. <laughs> I know there's going to be hell to pay if I run with it. Let's run with it anyway. Well, what's funny is I still, I, I, I still have that conflict, but it's about the audience, right? Because the audience right. funds my show. Yes, so it's yes. like, okay, how do I approach this so that the audience will actually listen to what I'm saying? Because, you know, net neutrality is an example of this. Uh, the recent Google memo is an example mm-hmm. of this, where there's people in your audience who are on both sides or three or four sides of an issue. There's usually more than two. And it's like, I have to present this in a way that everybody will at least listen to the conversation. I I suppose there's a conversation there. I just assume that everybody who's on the other side of net neutrality is on the take. (laughs) That's just my assumption. They've got, they've got a stock that'll pay off with it or, they're getting paid directly. You definitely need to listen to our episode on net neutrality because there's like 16 sides to net neutrality. Oh, yeah, I bet. <laughs> I, can't, I can't picture them, but I, I'm, you're right. I'm going to have to go find out what they are. And that's why it's so great. If you can't picture yeah. it yourself, at least you can hear people voicing them. And that brings you to the point where you say, what? Oh, maybe I can think about this a little bit differently myself. And, you know, I find all the time they're just between – me and Justin and Blair, we have our own various perspectives on things. And then we add another voice like Tom Merritt to it. And then there's a whole, whole another ball of earwax there. <laughs> yeah. Two balls. I got two. Yeah. Ears. And so let's talk more about science. 
science and technology. They kind of go hand in hand. Don't you think, Tom? Yeah, absolutely. Um, it's actually one of my favorite crossovers is when there is a story that I will hear. I will do it on Daily Tech News Show because I'm like, oh, this is a really cool angle of technology research that's happening. Uh, that's it, Maybe it's in the lab, but it, it promises to be something good in the tech world down the road. Then I hear Anthony Carboni and Jeff Kanata uh, making fun of it on We Have Concerns and I get like a really fun perspective. And then it's covered on This Week in Science and I get a whole new understanding of it because I hear your three perspectives on it. But uh, I've, I brought a couple of those kinds of stories that we've talked about on DTNS. Awesome. So let's hear them. What do you got for me first? At Columbia Engineering published a study in the Journal of Neural Engineering describing a system that combines a little mind reading with a little alternate artificial intelligence for hearing aids. So one of the problems with hearing aids when you're in a loud room is that natural human ability to isolate a particular speaker is harder to do. This system uses deep neural networks to separate the speakers before it even gets to the hearing aid, to be able to say, okay, we think there's five people speaking and we think we know that this bit of audio is from that person, this is a bit of audio is from that person. Uh, then they monitor the neural recordings of a person's brain to find out which speaker they're trying to pay attention to. They can tell with a little bit of you know wow. electrodes on you like, okay, it seems like what they're trying to hear, what they're trying to focus on is this part of the speech. So the AI then says, great, amplify just that speaker to help that speaker stand out a little more. That's amazing. Because that's one of the issues, especially with like the cocktail party effect where there's a din and there are all the different voices. And maybe you want to talk to a person right across from you, but your hearing aid doesn't know that. It just amplifies everything based on yeah. its, it, the, its normal amplification, how far it is w- away from you and maybe the, um, and maybe the, the frequencies that are, that are in that, that, that person's speech. So there are a bunch of different interesting things in here. A net neural network. So yeah. This is, this is, so this is an AI learning algorithm. Right. So they do the typical deep learning thing and, teach it how to recognize different speakers uh, in order to then have it do that for the person who has the hearing aid. They, they aren't able in the, in the lab, they weren't able to do it in a portable way yet, but they've been able to do both pieces in ways that could be portable. So the next step is to, to put it all together in a package. Yeah, so it, it seems like it seems like the framework should already be there in the brain. We we evolved at one point from a from a junglish environment. Uh, in nature, you have to be paying attention to all the sounds around you. Our our brain actually does a a very good job of deciphering a conversation in a crowded room. Uh, but when when it's interesting when the hearing deficit is there, when the audio is, is not there for you to pick apart, I can see how that framework would sort of get a little bit lost, have a harder time at at, at sort of silencing the the peripheral. Yeah, Um, and as you get older, it gets harder to pick those voices out of the din. And when the hearing aid is just making the din louder, (laughs) it doesn't really help much. Yeah. It's a a real dinner event. Conversation. Yeah, Yeah. (laughs) dinner conversation. Yeah, and what's fascinating as well is that they're able, I mean, this is something that has uh, been ongoing is uh, signal recognition in the brain. So recognizing certain patterns of brain activity as being related to certain behavioral uh, constructs, certain needs or actions or wants. Uh, and so to be able to take the, the neural data and reconstruct it in a way that can then be learned to match with the neural network so you can actually match the intent of the hearer with the voices of the speakers. Uh, this is impressive stuff. I mean, right now they probably have to walk around with a, I don't know, big boxes and computers and wires. <laughs> yeah. They had to use an invasive electrocorticography recording from neurological subjects undergoing epilepsy surgery for the paper that they presented but they have been able to do just that part without tying it into the rest of the system without being invasive. So they, they're hopeful that they can do it 
with an external electrode in the future. It, it seems like this also would be something that could be helped just with something like the Google goggles, right? Like, mm-hmm. like it just recognizes what you're looking at. It'd be terrible for eavesdropping when you're trying not to notice that you're being overheard. But if you're staring at somebody uh, and the Google, the goggles can pick it up and tell your, tell your, uh, your hearing aid, Hey, mm-hmm. amplify that uh, subject. That might be uh It might be a way around trying to (laughs) read the neurons for it. It's called auditory attention decoding is what they're trying to do. Awesome. Well, I hope they're able to do it. And yeah, and if, I mean, we have, there are those gaming headsets, the EEG arrays that people are using for um, using your mind to control games or for behavioral modifications to help you, uh, to help you meditate for mindfulness and that kind of stuff. But they can also, uh, if they can also record brain signals maybe it's just as easy as wearing a hat or a a a fascinator in the old term i do like a hat a hat or a fascinator you do exactly ed Ed, uh, Ed from connecticut says i'm okay with brain neural interface until they drill into your brain but you know ed the next generation of drilling into your brain isn't that bad they got this little ceramic it's like a tiny cork tiny stopper that they can pop in there uh that's that can totally mesh with the skull material around it it's very subtle now. Even people won't even know you're wearing a, a brain implant. Oh yeah, though no, that's gonna be the that's gonna be my old man moment when everybody's going to get their implant down at the Apple Store, and yeah. I'm like, ah, I don't know if I want Apple drilling into my brain. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and in the future, nobody's gonna be behind the back of their hand snickering at the size of your brain implant. <laughs> <laughs> uh, a whole new way to bully kids. Great. Yeah. No, no, it's going to, the, the, the future is so bright. And this, this news comes at a time also when, um, when hearing aids themselves are potentially going to be easier for people to access. And I don't know I'm waiting for a startup to disrupt the hearing aid world. Well, yeah, that, I mean, by bi- bipartisan Congress, I think it was 93 yeah. or 95 to one that they voted to, to allow hearing aids without a prescription over exactly. the counter. Yeah. It's, going, it's huge. That's going to change a lot. I mean, it's huge people. to get Congress to agree on anything. <laughs> Bipartisan support. You can do it, guys. You can do Especially it. Especially when it comes to health care. <sighs> uh, but moving on from hearing, you had a you had a fun sleep device. We all like sleep because, oh I mean, God. obviously Congress wasn't asleep at the wheel on this one. And no one should be sleeping right now. But no. maybe you have a problem sleeping and you need to do research and you're like, oh, but I don't want to go and lay in a the freaking machine for my sleep research. Well, researchers at MIT have developed an AI another AI that analyzes radio signals to measure sleep stages. So this is the exact opposite, non-invasive entirely. It's a little box, kind of like a router. Uh, It emits a low power radio wave, kind of like a Wi-Fi router. So if you've got a Wi-Fi router in your house, you've got almost exactly the same thing. It just does a different thing with its radio waves than this box does. This box analyzes the reflections of the radio waves. And the key again was training a deep neural network to recognize what was respiration, what was pulse, and what was just bouncing off the wall and tell the difference among all of that information. In a test of 25 healthy volunteers, the new technique using the box was 80% accurate, which may not sound that impressive to you, but that is comparable to an EEG monitored by specialists. Those specialists are only about 80% accurate. This means sleep studies wouldn't need to be restricted to lab situations or special hotel rooms with people around you while you're trying to sleep. Uh, But electrodes could just be attached. uh, You wouldn't even have to have electrodes attached to your head. Sorry, I mean, you would just have this box. Um, Electrical engineering and computer science professor Dina Katabi led this study and she'll be presenting it or is presenting it, did present it today at the International Conference on Machine Learning, August 9th. I think this is so cool. I mean, we've been uh, having reports for a while that we could use Wi-Fi and Bluetooth potentially to see through walls or for a certain amount, for a certain amount of, you know, maybe if you were if you were a spy You could (laughs) are interested in the activities of people in a certain location. You could potentially use these radio frequency signals to be able to pick up the movements of people or uh, their activities. And we know that it's gotten sensitive enough that things like pulse can be determined. And so to actually take that technology and create something that is applicable to not to, to research, but also that could potentially be 
purchased by individuals to help them monitor their own sleep without yeah. having to sleep on something or go into, like you said, a sleep lab. I mean, I've never wanted to go in because I'm like, I, how could I sleep covered in, in all those wires? And what if I had to get up at night and go to the bathroom? <laughs> I have problems sleeping. Here's what you do. Let's cover you in wires <laughs> right. and put you in an MRI machine. <sighs> huh, he's not I just, sleeping. I just did a sleep test uh, not too long ago. It was pretty uninvasive. There was That's one. Good. There was one thing that you you jam your finger into, and it like gel collapses on it. It like holds it tight there, so it's checking your pulse, I guess, throughout the night. Uh, so they're not. Heart. So they're not all as bad as they used to be. It sounds like that's good. No, and then there was one piece that I I taped up to my chest, and that was just kind of like it. Like it was. It was a little janky. There was wires yeah, yeah. around, and I was connected to a box that was monitoring the thing. But it, well, was, it wasn't about, like making noises or yeah, yeah, totally <laughs> ping, invasive or anything. Ping, yeah, ping, and I did it at home. I didn't have to go anywhere. Right, that's I could nice. be home for it. Well, and that's the nice thing about this situation too is they they could give you the box, you take it home, plug it in, and that's it. That's all the setup. Yeah. Nobody has to set it up for you, and then it can it can record for nights on end and build up a, a bigger data profile of you. Yeah, see, and that was the thing too. I only got the device for one night and had to like return it right away. Yeah. So, so was that night a typical night or was that a rough night or was that a night where I got a lot? There's no way to tell. Well, considering how much, uh, what are they called, Fitbits and Apple Watches can figure out just on your wrist in terms of your sleep cycle, they can estimate when you're in REM sleep based on that. I'm I'm not surprised it's making these these uh, pretty big advances, but I think it would be really cool if if that's what it turned into, right? It was just your go or just just your Fitbit would be able to do all of the sleep study work for you. Then you could crowdsource sleep study information. You could just add, people could opt in via their their device on their wrist. To well, you could study. do all kinds of motion study. I mean, I hadn't even thought about it going the other direction. There's radio waves bouncing off of us all the time these days, right? If your Fitbit could do what this box does and just read the radio waves bouncing around, it could tell not just about sleep, but about motion and gait and all kinds of stuff. Yeah. Although, although to my, uh, my friend at work who, who's been very proud of his, his Fitbit steps, but is also a, an Italian He's descent a gesticulator <laughs> when he talks, I pointed out, like, every time you do this, the thing thinks you're walking. He's like, no, no, no. It tracks through GPS. You have to actually move somewhere. I'm like, okay, so we did the experiment where he sat there and did this for a little while and then checked it and was like, oh, man. <laughs> <laughs> How many steps did he get just talking to you? Just talking. Just talking like this. It was just adding them up. Each one of these was a, was a, was a step. It is so, exercise. When you talk yeah, it's yeah. exercise. Yeah, when you talk with your hands, but... He, I think he, he dry, he's make, like maybe lost thousands of steps a day. Yeah. Oh, yeah. no. That's hilarious. Well, it's just, yeah, it's just unfortunate. The, the arms, you know, they don't activate the cardiovascular system the same way that your legs yeah. do. It's unfortunate. Yeah. All right. So moving on from sleep and exercise, you can find Tom reporting on all of stuff like this, gadgety, science, technology, and also straight up tech the news with the big tech giants and what's going on yeah. with them. 18 core processors, all that stuff. Right. At 18 core. Wow. Yeah. Intel just announced one <laughs> at the daily tech news show. And if you're not listening to it, it's a great program with, as, as the intro said, with amazing guests, intelligent yes. guests, but I want to get to the, the science of your science fiction. Now, Tom, mm -hmm. I'm waving this book around for those of you who yes, are listening to the podcast. Yes, that, just that book. Get your steps in with that book. I know. I'm getting my steps in, waving around Tom's Hey, wait, book. quit waving it. How will I know what the title of the book is if you keep <laughs> moving it around? Oh, it's there called we go. Pilot X, and it is science fiction in the most wonderful, hard to, hard to address subject matter, time First travel. Fantastic cover. It's time travel. This is a wonderful, it's a wonderful book. So tell me, how did you go about figuring out the science for your fiction? Yeah. So, I mean, first of all, this is definitely not hard science fiction. This is very much on the space opera end of things. As far as the story goes, I just avoid a lot of the physics in it, <laughs> well but done. the actual 
method of time travel I wanted to embrace was based on the idea that if you could travel in time, you couldn't change the past. That space time is unitary. And if I have gone back to 1965 and met my mom, that's already happened. It's in my mom's experience and I can't go back and convince her not to have me or create paradoxes. Like right. it's, it's just, um, it's just a unitary thing. And we are, we always privilege our point in time, but from an, like if you could be an outside perspective on time, it would all just be a solid unit with everything having already happened. But then what's the fun, Tom? <laughs> that. That was the that was the thing that I figured out. I'm like, okay, I set myself this challenge. How can I tell a story? Right now, here's here's my way of explaining it. Right now, you know that the planet's surface is stable, right? Like if you just take this slice in time, everything on the planet is where it is and it can be known and there's no real surprises if you can go through and look at the entire planet. But you can't. You can't see beyond this little realm. And even if you travel, you can only still see a small part of the planet. Now, blow that up to the entire universe with multiple civilizations. Even if you can travel in time, even if your entire civilization can travel in time, as long as you have a limited lifespan and you're not immortal, you can't visit every point in time. So there are still surprises. There are still things that people are like, oh, I, I, I didn't know that this area of time existed and these events were happening here. That's what caused this other thing to happen. And so on the grand scale, the major plot point is that there is a dimensional war being fought in secret. They're trying to hide it in places of space time that people never visit in eras and locations. And then there's smaller things like this guy keeps showing up to invite my main character to a party, but it's too early in his timeline. He keeps getting it wrong. <laughs> <laughs> so I love, I, I really like this. So in, in counterpoint to say Dr. Who, where he can go everywhere at any time and he regenerates. So he is basically immortal. He can know all of space and time and all of the species and in all parts of the universe and know everything about it. Whereas your character or the, um, your character, your main character, and also the individuals in it cannot. Yeah. I mean, even even the doctor shouldn't know everything in time, and the universe is very right. big, um, but they break those rules all the time, right? Yeah. I love Doctor Who. I love time travel stories. Uh, I, I, I love Star Trek and all of those time travel, and sometimes they annoy people. I love them, but it still bugs me when they change things. And it's, it's a yeah. fair cop out <laughs> it's both fair and a cop out to say oh uh quantum alternate universe right this isn't mm -hmm. the original timeline anymore it's like all right i guess you can get away with that but i wanted to try to write a story where that the making that happen is very energy intensive to to move to an alternate timeline would take way more energy than any civilization has and so let's talk about your ship and the ability of the ship that you've come up with to travel through time. Um, yeah, she. I named her Verity after uh, Verity Lambert, uh, who worked on the original Doctor Who. And, and she is an AI who, uh, of course, isn't a person and doesn't have a sense of humor. Or does she? Or does she? That's one of my favorite things. She, she keeps saying things that could be taken as just flat delivery yeah. or actually a, an attempt at a joke? Sarcasm, no, I, I do. I played a lot with that, with the ship. I turned the ship into a character that that's pilot X's friend. And, and, you know, there might be a little more, more interest there if there could have been uh, between an AI and a person and, and certainly his closest companion and the ship. Very often I had her say things that could be read two ways. I really tried to have almost everything she say, says to be able to be read as flat emotionless logic or the kind of thing someone very sardonic and satirical might say. But if and it comes does, out flat, yeah, but, you can't tell. Yeah. But how, how does she, how did, I, I love the description of how, of how, can she, how she can exist in any point in space. 
she's a singularity was that oh right yeah no the, yeah. the ship carries a singularity in it uh so that's how he can store everything <laughs> Uh, and, and, and of course, Verity has access to that singularity. So, so she can, she can see a lot more because of that. Um, that, that is definitely one of those things where the science probably doesn't bear very close scrutiny. <laughs> um, you know, how, how do you keep that singularity accessible in the ship as it moves around through space and time? But, but somehow they do. That's, that's as far as I get there. Right. So you're not actually addressing the physics of the energy required to maintain yeah, a singularity yeah. or to I, actually. I did do kind it. of do a little hand waving of like the singularity doesn't actually move. It's just their point of access that has to move. So it's like a, mm -hmm. a wormhole entry that they keep having to create. But the singularity itself is still where it always has. What kind, if you could imagine what kind of energy source they use for their time travel? I know you didn't really address it directly, but. What do you think? What do you think it could possibly be? Do you have any have any ideas? Yeah, so I'm I'm tempted to to be snide and and just make up a word because that's right. that's kind of it's like they found a source that is right. not inexhaustible because that's unbelievable, but is really efficient. <laughs> it's always tough. It's always tough because there's always like asteroid mining and, and junk going on in, in sci-fi. And they're pulling out these weird materials. It's like, wait, we have an elemental table already. Yeah. Like, we, like, this is already, the universe has already been broken down to its constituents. There's not other different stuff just because you've got an asteroid. But, and, and that's kind of why I avoided it, because I didn't want to go down that rabbit hole. But at the same time, there is a pattern of us figuring out how to use the materials that have always been around in a different way to get more energy out of them. Yeah. So it's it's florbium that they they've developed florbium, which is a derivative of of course of exium, which was discovered uh, by the Terentians, uh, now extinct race, uh, and was mined out of carbon. <laughs> there we go. Did you did you when you write? Do you come up with the universe? Do you have a playbook or a Bible that kind of describes things before you get started writing? Or do you just kind of get, just put it all out there? I, I with, with most of my books, I start with little vignettes. I think of the world before the story. And so I, with Pilot X, I wrote a sketch of Pilot X landing on the planet and people reacting to where he had been. Uh, I wrote a sketch of his first flight. Uh, and so I, I write all these little things to kind of get an idea of the characters and the world it's living in. And I will start to build up, it's not quite a Bible, but it's a note pad of like, oh, these are the names of the major races and this is their characteristics and these are the characters. And then when I go to actually sit down and create the entire story, I've got that as a reference. Right. And you can't just like walk into all of that on the first day. Today we walk into a bazaar of all races, gather them together, and we'll have to do a little backstory, a little definition, a little explanation, and explain yeah. of all of these different kind of run into them one at a time along the way so that they have some sort of lasting impact or you interact with them for a little while, right? Well, and, and what I did is I, I created three races. There's no humans in this. There are three races. One of them is very humanoid and the other two aren't. And those are very well developed and explained. And then there's some minor side planets that get visited that that are that you you don't have to know their whole backstory. There's you know there's a a a, a monk planet and a pineapple planet and a trade planet. When you, you know. say pineapple planet, yes, <laughs> pineapple planet. It, there are the no beans pineapples there. Are pineapples <laughs> just looks like one. Yeah, there, no, are, there are no pineapples there anymore. No exactly. pineapples. Or is it just a coincidence? That word it's, means something completely different when you're. It's in a. It's the old saying: the pineapple planet. There are no pineapples there. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah. The old saying, of course. It's an old Linden <laughs> saying. Settled that, okay. <laughs> I don't want to tell you, Blair, because it would actually spoil part of the All book. All right, so. okay. I'll read the book. You should read the book, Blair. It's like, okay. It's quite good. I mean, I'll tell you afterwards. If you don't hear about reading. I just don't want to spoil it for anybody else. No, I definitely will read it, uh, Kiki. Maybe if we finish it by next week, I can get it from you. Right. I have finished it, so yes. Ah. I can I'll see you in real human space. Bring it to the eclipse. Hey, Tom, are you going to the eclipse? 
I am not. Um, I'm, I'm very sad about this uh, because there is an unmovable event that I have to go to involving family that will prevent me. But right, I mean, sounds like one see, of those I'll moments. See some of it from LA, but I, I won't get to yeah. go to one of those optimal spots. Right. This sounds like one of those moments in time that cannot be changed. Yes, fixed yes. point in time. Point and in that's time. why you're avoiding it. I yeah. see. I see. <laughs> the niece, my niece is a fixed point in time. <laughs> yes. You should write that in her card. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for making me miss the eclipse. <laughs> Happy birthday. You're a fixed point in time. Maybe someday you'll understand what that means. Oh, or give her the book and the sign, sign that inside. Sign that inside. Point in time. <laughs> love, Tom. <laughs> yeah. Do you have any other books that you're thinking about? Do you do you constantly have little ideas? Or is, I are do. you writing constantly, or is this kind of like a spurt thing? No, I'm I'm always writing something. Um, I've got four or five that I've self-published at TomMerrittBooks.com. Uh, and I've got one that I just sent out to my Patreon. I have a Patreon for my writers particularly. And I just sent one out about a colony ship uh, that has lost power. And it's so big that parts of the ship have devolved into a more primitive society. And so there's the, the challenges for the captain and the command crew to still run the ship uh, and they actually have to turn science into a religion to keep the ship running without ha- being able to explain to the entire populace because they can't weapon. properly educate because yeah. they don't have enough power. That's that's interesting. I mean, that, that's not hard to do. I mean, we kind of see that um, pe- people saying that a bit about people, people making science a bit of dogma or their the science fandom kind of in the same way that people can be excited and and into new tech gadgets. It's like, they're excited about science and science is going to fix everything and it's wonderful. And you just get, there's so much emotion behind it as opposed to understanding that it's a tool. Yeah. Well, it's, you know, you don't really have to explain any scientific concepts for it to get somebody to be able to charge their iPhone. Like you just teach them how to plug stuff in yeah. and don't, remind don't, them to do don't it put when your this finger in here, put this right. thing in here. And, and then, when this little bar turns red, that's when you want to make sure yeah. you've got it plugged in. Right. And that's when somebody says, Hallelujah, for love of science. <sighs> yes. Well, so for for instance, not not to spoil, I just sent out the beta version to my Patreon supporters to do a beta read of. And one of the things that I have happen is they used to, everyone would look through the telescope at the eventual uh, destination of the ship, but so many people have forgotten that they're actually even on a ship that now it's become a ritual to look at what they call the hope point. And, and they just, they they sort of like, well, let's keep the habit going without having to fight to explain what this is about. That's, yeah. that's a, it's so it's really fasc- fascinating about that too, is you could create all the sort of different aspects of of a that you can see within a single religion like there there could be some somewhere who are like worshiping the image of the captain yeah no the captain's men is the name of the priesthood in the book okay beautiful perfect right yeah and others others may have like scientific devices that they've got up on an altar that nobody's allowed to touch because they've got the you can go through all of the oh that's fun i love it so anyway that's in the works Where's your, where, that's in the works on your Patreon right now? Yeah, that's at patreon.com slash ace detect. Ace detect. A-C-E-D-T-E-C-T. Wow, good job. You remembered how to spell that stupid name. I do. <laughs> <laughs> I do. I tweet to you all the time. Ace detect is also your Twitter handle. And we are going to move into some more science stuff. Tom, I, you're sticking around to talk with us about all this science. Yes? Yeah, if you'll let me, that'd be great. All right, so... Uh, if you want to rattle off really fast before we move into Blair's Animal Corner, the places people can find you online, please. Sure. Uh, as you said, twitter.com slash ace to tech, but also uh, tommerritt.com, dailytechnewsshow.com, and swordandlaser.com. Uh, well, that'll get you to either the things I do or get you to links to the other things I do. Perfect. So, Blair, hmm. everyone, you know what time it is? What time is it? Time for Blair's Animal Corner. She loves our creature, great and small. Biped, milliped, no pet at all. If you want to hear about animals, she's your girl. Except 
except for giant pandas and squirrels and a boat Yes? Oh, Justin's not here. I, I was waiting for <laughs> Justin to go, what you got, Blair? Oh, man. <laughs> I'm like, why, why is I'm so conditioned? Talking? I was you waiting. Are. Okay, <laughs> so what I've got to start are counting bees. So bees, we've talked about this before. They understand numbers pretty well. Uh, even as early as 2009, we were able to deduce that they could do some basic arithmetic, like 12 minus 3 equals 9 which is amazing enough. But now a new piece of research uh, from University of Melbourne has found that bees understand the concept of zero. Why would a bee need to understand zero? Algebra. That is a good question. Right? <laughs> yes. And so first of all, I had to understand what it means to understand zero <laughs> because I understand that nothing is less than something, but that's not what understanding zero is. Understanding zero is that zero is less than one. One is less than two. So to understand that, to not say something versus nothing, but to understand that it is a numerical integer less than one. Okay, so it's like actual something that so, could become one when you add one to it. Right, right. So as it's a, a arithmetic representation, basically, rather than yeah. just the lack yeah. of a thing. So the way they researched this, it was, it's pretty interesting. They they found first of all that bees do much better if they're punished for bad behavior as well as rewarded for good behavior. Which wow is very interesting to me. So what they did is they had different platforms. Bees were given a sweet sucrose solution as a reward for the right, the right selection. And on another platform, they were given a nasty tasting quinine solution. Then that's the, the wrong answer. And what they found was that the bees associated a platform that had fewer shapes on it with the sweet rewards. So they had to pick the lesser than so six and four, four and three, right? They had to pick the lesser number. They did that about 80% of the time, which is right in line with the previous research that I was talking about where they were able to do some arithmetic. But the next step of the test was taking differently shaped objects to confirm that it's the number of shapes and not the size of stuff. Mm. They did that at about the same success, 80%. And then they were given a choice between two or three shapes and zero shapes. So three, two, or zero. Bees picked zero with around the same amount of accuracy. Oh, I get it. And so if they didn't understand zero, they'd pick two because Correct. two is less than three. Correct. Um. Yes. And then they did another experiment where they were trained in the same way, but they had to choose to land on a platform with either zero or between one and six objects. And they consistently chose zero, wow. but they were less accurate and took more time when the other option was one rather than two, three, four, five, or six, hmm. which means they are making a numerical decision. So you said 80% accuracy? That was the, with the first experience. So Experiment. they got a B. Yes. Oh. They got a B. <laughs> <laughs> yes, they did. <laughs> yeah. So because they, they, they messed up more when it was between one and zero than when it was between six and zero means they were actually thinking about it like a number. Hmm. Yes. And because one, the difference between one and zero is less than the difference between zero yeah, and two enough. or zero and three. Right. right, right, absolutely, yeah. So this study shows that B's comprehension of zero is actually similar to that of humans and primates done in previous trials, but they haven't done a lot of trials on other animals other than primates on the recognition of zero. So if bees can figure it out, it's time for us to start looking in some other places in the animal kingdom as well. And so the, you know, it's, the question is, you know, what is this numerical ability helping them with? Is it something to do with their navigation? 
Is it something to do with their foraging? Why would the, mm -hmm. why would this numerical calculating ability make sense for them to have yeah. evolved? Yeah. So why would they need to know that zero is less than one and not just when there's nothing? Right. I mean, maybe it's, maybe it's possible. Maybe it has to do with a pollen harvesting and mm -hmm. having quantities of pollen left in flowers. Yeah. Knowing that, seems that a flower... Like, that seems like a hard thing to count. I, I wonder yeah. if it has... I would but think it has more to do with... Well, I, I would wonder if it has... <laughs> Ooh, burn. I would wonder if it has more to do with um, uh, identifying how many other bees are, like, in an area. Like, right. ah, there's too many bees here already. I should go where there's less bees because I, then I'm more likely to find a flower that still has pollen on it. I would wager. I'm going way knowing, down into stoicism logic for bees, but it's. I would wager that knowing what zero is, is a fundament, fundamental part of doing proper arithmetic. We did math without zero for a thousand years. Did you? <laughs> so bees are smarter than medieval Europe, is what you're saying. <laughs> Did medieval Europe not have zero? No, they borrowed it from uh, from the Middle East. The Middle East, yeah, oh, wow. Arabic. Oh, shoot, I had no idea. Um, that's very interesting. Uh, dumb Europeans. I don't know. <laughs> I think <laughs> that even though, yeah, but to even do though advanced they math, right? Yeah, you to do advanced math, and maybe they, they didn't. Maybe the maybe the Europeans didn't have a zero that we can go back and look in the books for, but maybe they, you know, maybe they had. They, they Humans had a concept it. of zero. It yeah. was a concept yeah. of it. Yeah. Probably. yeah. Even if there was right. no representation for it, I'm sure. Right. Because you also have to be able to understand when weighing the best option for something, if you have nothing or you have almost nothing, maybe neither is worth your time. <laughs> Maybe it's, it's an important question. Yeah. Maybe, maybe. But one thing I, I do love about this, I mean, seriously, we're talking about insects. This is a bee yeah. with a neural ganglia with a very limited number yeah. of neurons. Just a nerve ball, not even a brain. Not even I, a full I, brain. I remember yes. in a philosophy course I took in college, the idea of zero being, you know, Complex. batted around as one of the things that makes us human. Yeah. Oh, Oops. sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Another one bites the dust yeah. on that list. More and more. One of the yeah. things that connects us to the rest of nature, maybe. That's right. yeah. <laughs> yes. Well, speaking of animals that we have shortchanged in the past in the invertebrate world, I want to talk about cockroaches. What are cockroaches good for? Does anyone know? Um, Stepping on? <laughs> yeah. Wait, they, make, um, they let you know, know you're still walking on the sidewalk. Oh, oh, oh yeah. turning into remote control robots. There Ooh, is that. That, that is for darn sure. Getting a discount well, on your rent. Yes, <laughs> that as well. Cleaning beneath the fridge. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. <laughs> so here's, here's a really important one, it turns out cockroaches are for. Cockroaches are the key to certain plants' survival. Really? How so? Oh, let me tell you. So the azalea plant, Monotropastrum humili, is a forest floor herb, um, and they have a really weird way of growing. So they, first of all, they completely rely on a fungus for nutrients, and it's fleshy fruit. Fruit is the seed nutrients, right, that either help the, the seed to grow, or more commonly, fruit actually lures kind of natural farmers, propagators, seed dispersers to eat the fruit and then poop out the seed later somewhere else with a nice little uh, fertilizer packet, right? So it has a fleshy fruit that has hundreds of seeds. It's a very small seed. It's about a third of a centimeter. And they have a hard seed coat. When the fruit ripens, the fruit drops to the ground. The whole plant stalk falls down sometimes. The pulp is then at ground level, but what's really weird is that the fruit has no scent. It's a dull white color, and it's inconspicuous against leaf litter, and it's not sweet. So this fruit 
it sounds like it's kind of failing at its job. It has no reason for a vertebrate to come and eat it. This is where our cockroach comes in. Mm. So the, the forest cockroach, Blatella nipponica, which is um, just a, a kind of a run-of-the-mill cockroach you'd find in a forest, they consistently in the study visited and consumed this pulp. And then they pooped about three to ten hours later and each of these little pellets, about one millimeter long, had about three seeds in it. Mm. What's more, the seeds were as viable as seeds removed directly from the pulp. So they were intact. They were able to grow. And so these cockroaches, it sounds like they are seed dispersers. Wow. Wow. Okay, so they're dispersing the seeds. Sometimes when seeds go through the digestive tracts of animals or invertebrates, they become more likely to grow. Did they say whether or not there was a, an increased likelihood? It was about the same, except that it helped them move. So since it's three to ten hours later, the cockroaches moved the seeds way farther than the seeds would get on their own. So that was the main plus on this side is that they were able to kind of transport the little baby plants far away. What's really interesting is that the fruit ripening period for this azalea plant coincides with the eclosion period of the forest cockroach. Eclosion. Eclosion is when the insect emerges from the pupil case mm, or hatches from the egg. So it's when they turn into adults, which and is when they're, they're really hungry. Start. Yes, they're really hungry. I bet they so, used all sorts of energy in their pupation and their transformation, and now they're like, I'm hungry. Yeah. I could eat so, an azalea. As great. far as we can tell, this azalea plant is pretty much dependent on the forest cockroach. Huh. Yeah, so they help well, with the abundance of the plant habitat. They, they exactly align with the life cycle of this azalea and the long quote transit times or digestion times of the seeds through their gut gives a really long distance dispersal. Yeah. And so this is the first time ever that we've seen that cockroaches are seed dispersers, but it's also the first time we've looked and there are about 4,600 cockroach species we've found so far on this planet. So, so the it, likelihood yeah. yeah, that there are more is very high. So this reminded me actually of how a few months ago we found out that some mosquito species are pollinators. Mm -hmm. Now cockroaches, it turns out, they also have a job. They're seed dispersers. Hmm. Well, these are outdoor cockroaches, right? Yes, yes. outdoor. Yes. But who knows? Well, Maybe right? that cockroach on your kitchen floor is actually trying to Propagate a plant to your neighbor's <laughs> right there. backyard. Just moving the mold. From <laughs> one just passing through, man. It just uh, passing uh, through, uh, man. Underneath the sink. I was wondering about that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Little Johnny Azalea seed, just doing my job here. Yes, yes, absolutely. You wanted this fern transplanted to the backyard, right? I'm taking care of that. Don't worry about that. <laughs> Hey, thanks, little cockroach. Thanks Let's for go being back to my sleep. gardener. There we go. <laughs> your azaleas are so beautiful. What's your secret? Oh, oh yes. I just have thousands. Well, first, mind your step. Thousands Second. of cockroaches. <laughs> I was just doing my job, and then the foot came down. Oh, no. Oh, I love that we've learned something good about cockroaches. A reason to love cockroaches. There may be more than one seed disperser among them. That's right. So just next time you see one, picture a little straw hat on their head, <laughs> a little spade in one of their hands. They're just little gardeners. That's right. And you know what? It's time for us to take a moment. I don't know I was gonna, where I was going to go with that. We're going to take a short break. <laughs> <laughs> it's time for us to take a very short break. Stay tuned for more This Week in Science. We'll be back in just a few moments with much more science news. Remember, I've got neutrons. We've also got some dark matter. Justin brought something to talk about. <laughs> Stay tuned. This is This Week in Science.
Hey, everybody. I hope you are enjoying the show. Remember that if you are not subscribed to us, you can subscribe on iTunes, in the Google Play podcast portal, also on Spreaker and Stitcher and TuneIn. You can tell if you have an Alexa, you can tell your Alexa to play This Week in Science and she will do it for you. It's very exciting news. We're also on YouTube and Facebook So look for This Week in Science and check us out in those locations. Otherwise, you can head over to twist.org. And twist.org is the portal for all things twist, where you can find links to all the things that hopefully you're looking for. And if you're looking for ways to support twists, here they are. Number one, you can get our merchandise at the Zazzle store. Click on the Zazzle store link in the main header bar over at twist.org that will take you directly to Zazzle. Our, the direct link is zazzle.com slash This Week in Science. And in that store, you will find all sorts of twist items, tote bags, t-shirts, hats, lumbar pillows with the twist logo emblazoned all over them or a bit of Blair's Animal Corner art from her previous Animal Corner twist calendars. She's working on a new one, you know. This year, it's going to be a coloring book calendar. So you have a new calendar to look forward to this year. We're going to start pre-orders for that pretty soon. Look for the link on twist.org. But, you know, peruse the stuff at Zazzle. If you need some new clothes, if you want to find a way to tell the world you love twists, this is one way to do that. A portion of the proceeds do go back directly to us and help keep this show going. Additionally, you can support us directly by clicking on the donate button that is on our website. Click on that donate button. It will take you to a little PayPal interface where you can donate to your heart's content. And then finally, if you want to click on the Patreon button, Patreon will take you to our Patreon page. The direct link is patreon.com slash this week in science, where you can click on the become a patron button and become a patron in an ongoing fashion, a patron of the Twist Podcasting Arts. And we do hope that you will help us continue to produce Twist, be a producer by being a patron or donating or buying our merchandise merchandise on Zazzle. If you are unable to do any of those things, please just tell your friends about Twist. Use social media, use your voice, write a letter, make a flyer, I don't know, put an ad in the weekly in your hometown. Maybe ask people to listen to twists. It's once a week, a little bit more than an hour nowadays, maybe closer to two, but I think we're worth it. Don't you? We really could not do any of this without you. Thank you for your support. And we are back with more This Week in Science. And you know what? I have got stories. I told you I did. I brought them. You guys want to hear about neutrinos bumping? Yeah. Yeah. We've, we've got neutrinos bumping. I'm a oh, neutrino fan jumping. Huh? Neutrinos are a very interesting form of matter, right? They're these subatomic particles, little tiny things that are really hard to detect they just don't run into things because they're nothing bothers them nothing bothers whizzing right now there are neutrinos whizzing through us past us through the floor nothing bothers them they just pass right through most of the time without bumping into anything without colliding with anything we have these huge neutrino detectors underground with these massive photo multipliers in the hopes that we can detect one of these collisions, that if a neutrino bumps into an atom, that that atom will be shaken up enough to blow off some other particles and a little burst of light, a photon. And that that photon could then be photomultiplied and photomultiplied until they could measure it and say, we saw a neutrino and learn about neutrinos, which are very interesting. Did you know there are flavors of neutrinos? And I'm not talking about chocolate, strawberry, thin mint, or peanut butter. Tau and mu and yeah, three I different do, I flavors do and electrons. Like electron colors and, and 
some neutrinos. Of them are strange. Neutrinos have these moons and towers. It's it's a little bit of like losing the ability to, to. We have a differentiation of this thing that's already hard to explain to people. Mm-hmm. We'll call it flavor. We'll call it color. We're gonna we're just gonna try to tack on something that somebody could relate to. To Up, understand. down, and strangely charming. Yes. It's strange and charming. <laughs> strangely charming? No. Yes. So these electron muon tau neutrinos, they also jump back and forth. They, they switch between types. They don't just stay an electron neutrino, especially if they bump, if they collide with something and energy is released, they're going to switch into a different kind of neutrino. And so they turn into these different flavors. My favorite detector is the ice cube detector array that's in Antarctica. It's this kilometer big block of ice. Antarctic ice. It's the p- purest ice on the planet, just about. No, no particles in it. Just clear ice. And they drilled a bunch of holes in there, threw, put their photo detector arrays in it. And they've been detecting neutrinos from the sun, trying to find out about the different flavors of neutrinos. Well, 43 years ago, Daniel Friedman, a theoretical physit- physicist who's at the Mas- Massachusetts Inst- Institute of Technology in Cambridge, back 43 years ago, the year of my birth, 1974, here I am dating myself, he described a theory that was just recently actually discovered to be true. And it didn't take one of the giant detectors that we've built. It actually took a detector that was quite small, kind of the size of a coffee can. (laughs) And the exciting thing about this is they weren't actually seeing either this, this theory of these neutrinos. It wasn't a collision. It was a bump. It was a little, they describe it as if you rolled a ping pong ball, ball at a bowling ball, the kind of, effect that would have on the bowling ball is what they were trying to measure. <laughs> but they were also shooting, shooting bowling balls or they were shooting cue balls at it. They weren't shooting just cue waiting balls. for cue balls to fall waiting. from the sun. Yeah. Yes. So it was in a lab where they actually create neutrinos. Um, as They're part- spiking the punch here. <laughs> they were spiking the punch. Yes. And so um, the, the members of this collaboration called the Coherent Collaboration detected what is called coherent neutrino scattering. They reported it in science and they used the Spallation Neutron Source at Oak Ridge National Laboratory in Tennessee. And this is exactly what it, it's a neutron, a neutrino source. They it's they create beams of neutrons and there are lots of neutrinos that come out of those beams as well and so they went around the building around the facility basically trying to find the best spot to catch the neutrinos without getting the neutrons and other things and they found this hallway underground that was just kind of padded by concrete basically and they put their device in there and they measured it over a long period of time. And they measured a whole bunch of different, 461 days worth of data, 134 neutrino scattering events occurred, supporting this 43-year-old hypothesis. Finally, they're able to do it. And the clincher here, the big exciting thing here is that it was not, as I said, in a big neutrino detection facility. The device that they came up with could potentially lead to uh, a portable neutrino detector. Does anyone know why a portable neutrino detector could potentially be important? Uh, Can we take it in space? You could take it in space. Sure, it'd be easy to take to space. But more practically, you could maybe, you know, take it around to different nuclear facilities Uh, around the world uh, and find out if you're trying to... Fukushima... (laughs) Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Drop one into North Korea. Yeah. Right. Are, is somebody trying to make nuclear weapons that shouldn't be? Mm. Here, I've got my portable briefcase neutrino detector. Yeah, there'll be one at every airport soon. My milk jug says you're <laughs> lying. <laughs> yeah, and it, uh, so the 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 article is very well received, except by a team 
at Max Planck Institute for Physics in Munich, Germany, where they're tr they've been trying to develop a portable detector. They've been trying to detect coherent scattering at nuclear reactors. And uh, the main researcher, Stodolsky, Leo Stodolsky says, my colleagues and I have been going over this paper, hoping to find something wrong with it, but we haven't been able to find anything. <laughs> That's fantastic. Boy, that's like a mad that. scientist. That's like the highest compliment. Right? We really yeah. want you to be wrong. But yeah. we can't figure out any way that you might be. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, so. Yeah, so the, uh, this is a very exciting physics discovery in the physics community, but not just because it verifies a, an old hypothesis, which in itself is exciting, but because it potentially will lead to uh, future technologies and applications, which is always very neat. Um, and then moving on from neutrinos, I got dark matter clumping. I got my neutrinos bumping. And the dark matter, what? Oh, dark matter. We always want to know exactly how much there is. A lot? In the or, universe. Or, or just if it is. Or yeah. It is. What it is. I, I've, well, we know I've said it this is. on This Week in Science previously. I think one of these days we're going to find out that dark matter and dark energy are not what everybody thinks it is. It's going to be the new <laughs> ether. Yeah, a bit of it is. I, I, think, I think we've got placeholders and then there's going to be a whole... You know, emerging properties from a set of things going on that we overlook. That is a belief, not an evidence-based. Yeah. It absolutely yeah, is. Yeah, go bring that to this week in opinions, Joe. Well, <laughs> well, that's that's part of that's part of what uh, we get to do on this show is speculate around <laughs> the fringes of the science. And there is there is you know if they're if this is going to be dark matter. It's something completely different than everything we've been pinning on it so far. Well, then it's already heading in that direction. And how we find out what it is really is to have studies like this. Yeah, yes. absolutely. And the exciting thing here is that the dark matter measurement that was just recently reported and made was made by the Dark Energy Survey. So the survey for what? dark energy just <laughs> measured... Dark matter. Dark matter. Hmm. Yeah. <laughs> yes. And it's a very, very exciting uh, result. This is a five-year project, the Dark Energy Survey. And this August, they are just going into their fifth year of data collection. They just released 10 papers corresponding to the first year of data collection. What they've done is they've taken a picture a snapshot of the universe, uh, just a very thin sliver of it. And they're going to be pouring over, uh, pouring over the, the sliver over the, over the coming years. In looking at this very slim, thin sliver, they have been using gravitational mapping, gravitational lensing to accurately portray and represent the, the galaxies within the sliver of space that they are, have been looking at. And it's the most accurate measurement that they've ever made. And you know what? It supports the idea that dark matter makes up 26% of the universe. Wait, dark that's energy, all? That's it. Dark matter makes up 26% of the universe. And... 70% is dark energy. Hmm. Yes. And the exciting thing here, the interesting part of what they've done is the way that they've looked at it. It's um, they're looking at current time. There was the European Space Agency's orbiting Planck Observatory that looked back at the clumpiness that occurred just after the Big Bang in the cosmic background radiation. And they were able to take the measurements that they have currently and compare them to the measurements that the Planck survey had. And they were able to actually see, based on the original data from the Planck survey, how the clumpiness evolved over the last 13 and a half billion years to now. 
and they were able to actually do a comparison. So it's, it's able, they were able to, to basically say, this is what it looked like before. We have this from the cosmic background radiation, and now we know what it looks like. So we can estimate what happened in between. And so we can make estimates about the force of dark matter on pulling every matter together and the force of dark energy trying to kind of pull everything apart and allow for the expansion of the universe. Uh, so the two of these together support this very simple version of the dark matter, dark energy theory. And Joe Zuntz of the University of Edinburgh, who worked on the analysis of this, said, the moment we realized that our measurement matched the Planck result, which in, within 7% was thrilling for the entire collaboration. Something's there. Mm -hmm. Something's there. there this, is, this is detection by looking at the effects, right? Mm -hmm. And so you say, well, if what we think is causing this effect, then this other effect should be this. And then they look at that and they're like, wow, it turns out we were right. Exactly. We are, our, our hypotheses about how these forces work and, the, and how the universe is, how the, the forces are dynamically directing the evolution of the universe. We were right. Yeah, we, we, we're on it. And this is only the first year of this uh, of this survey. And so we have four more years of data, one more year of data collection, four more years of data analysis to, to come out. Um, and they're already ex the accuracy is unprecedented. So this is a very interesting thing. The, the Dark Energy Survey team developed new ways to detect the tiny lensing distortions of galaxy images. These are these are effects not even visible to the eye, enabling revolutionary advances in understanding the cosmic signals. And in the process, they created the largest guide to spotting dark matter in the cosmos ever drawn. And the new dark matter map is 10 times the size of one that was released by the Dark Energy Survey in 2015. And it will eventually be three times the size of what it is currently. Hmm. Yeah. yeah. Clumpiness in the universe, thanks to dark matter. Pretty fun. I thought it was pretty. I love dark matter. Dark matter, dark matter. We don't know exactly what you are yet, but we know where you are. Yeah. Dark matter makes it sound like something, though. If they just said something, we don't quite understand. Instead of dark matter every time. It's a branding problem. <laughs> it is. Yeah. It is. No, it's not. It's, it, would, it, it would be. Exactly it is it's dark matter it's yeah. matter that's dark that can't but be it might not be matter <laughs> it, no it is matter it's, uh, it's probably matter it's probably, <laughs> i mean okay yes but we are at the early stages of this amazing discovery of something we don't completely understand dark slowy stuff and dark fasty stuff right. is, doesn't sound as cool <laughs> yeah yeah that's not going to work for the branding at all back to the drawing board advertising team okay justin what you got so uh we all understand that we didn't evolve from chimpanzees but the uh, chimpanzees and us humans share a common ancestor uh, right. about six seven million years ago and we both evolved a bit since then we have a great deal of fossils to fill in the story of the changes that have taken place between ancient ape and man but there's not a whole lot known about the evolution uh, before that. The common ancestor has, uh, before 10 million years, we don't have a, much of a picture of anything that led up to that. Now, a discovery in Kenya of a remarkably complete fossil ape skull reveals what the common ancestor of all living apes and humans may have looked like. This is just announced. It's going to be the August 10th, which is tomorrow's edition of the scientific journal Nature. Uh, this belongs to an infant, the skull, that lived about 13 million years ago, nicknamed Alessi. The fossil is the skull of an infant, and it is the most complete extinct ape skull known in the fossil record. That is by itself a uh, feat and would be worth talking about. Uh, but this is of, of this is of greater consequence here. So this is initially it was found in 2014 by a Kenyan fossil hunter, John Kusi, and a 13 million year old rock lair, the Napujit, Napujit area, which is, it's like this volcanic 
area. It was a volcanic area 13 million years ago. It says here, uh, a volcanic volcano, nearby volcano, buried the forest where the baby ape lived, preserving the fossil and countless trees. It also provided us with the critical volcanic minerals by which we were able to date the fossil, says Craig S. Feeble, Rutgers University, New Brunswick. Many of the most informative parts of the skull are preserved inside the fossil. So to make them visible, the team used an extremely sensitive form of 3D X-ray imaging at the Synchrotron facility in Grenoble, France. They were able to reveal, we were able to reveal the brain cavity and inner ears and the unerupted adult teeth with their daily record of growth lines, says Paul Tafurea of the European Synchrotron Radiation Facility. The quality of our images was so good that we could establish from the teeth that the infant was about one year, four months old when it died. The uninterrupted teeth inside the infant's skull also indicated the specimen belonged to a new species. Nyanzapi thicus alessi is what they're calling it. Uh, it comes from the Turkana word for ancestor alice. And till now, all Nyanzapi thicus species were only known from teeth. And it was actually still a question about whether or not this was even an ape. Uh, importantly, this is, the, this is John Flegel, Stony Brook University, quoting... Importantly, the cranium was fully developed, had fully, uh, has fully developed bony ear tubes. An important feature linking it with living apes today. Oh, that was uh, Ellen Miller, Wake Forest University. Alessi's skull is about the size of a lemon. I think you had a picture of it up there. Ooh, and there they are hitting it with a laser. That has nothing to do with the experiment. That was just for fun. <laughs> <laughs> yes, what, what do archaeologists do when they actually get into a lab? They just shoot skulls with, with green lasers. No. With, with its notably <laughs> small snout, it looks most like a baby gibbon. This gives the initial impression that this is an extinct gibbon, observes Chris Gilbert of Hunter College, New York. However, on our analysis shows that this appearance is not exclusively found in gibbons and it evolved multiple times among extinct apes, monkeys, and their relatives. So, that the, uh, oh, the species was not gibbon-like in the way it behaved from those inner ear tubes, the way they were balanced inside the inner ear, the balance, the balance organ inside the inner ears, right? The way this thing was, was placed, these little ear tubes, inner ear tubes, where that was, how it was articulated, means that it probably wasn't jumping around the trees like a gibbon. It wasn't very acrobatic, in fact. Uh, the inner ear of Alessi shows that it would have had a much more cautious way of moving around, which is, which is an important, very important aspect of now understanding ape evolution. It wasn't just swinging from the trees and then down on the ground and, hey, let's start trying to move about a little less athletically. It started or, to get motion sickness. <laughs> right, it would have. <laughs> and like, I don't want to go up there. I'm not riding the ride, Mom. <laughs> no, this was already 13 million years ago. Ah, trees. Uh, this is awkward. Be careful. <laughs> My gosh. Yeah. Irma Gerd in the chat room says Tarzan would be really disappointed. It's true. Tarzan would have a lot of, you know, nausea issues. I just can't get past the fact that it's a Nyan ape. Nyan ape. <laughs> Instead of Nyan cat. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, so uh, yeah, an important piece of ancient, 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 ancient uh, human and ape ancestry being revealed here. In the most complete extinct ape skull ever found, and it's 13 million years old. That's fantastic all by itself. But again, yeah, we were we weren't we weren't necessarily uh, that that time in the trees that we keep referring back to is starting to get to the point where maybe we just went to the trees for a little bit and then <laughs> came back and like didn't yeah. hang out there much. Like realize it was something we tried on. It was vacation. It was. Yeah. It was just, you know, hey, let's. I see monkeys in the trees. Let's, we're, we're, we're kind of ape like, ape monkey like. We're not that different. Let's try this tree thing. And after a while, we're just, eh, not for me. This tree yeah. thing's for the birds. It's a, yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's just a phase we were going through, right? It was just, eh. 
Yeah. Let's go I think back it's down. wonderful. There's so much that we can learn from these little tiny, I mean, these in, little tiny inner ear bones and that this, uh, the x-ray scanning could help with that also. Get into the head where you can't yeah. dig it out. But the x-rays let us know that those bony inner ear pieces were in there and how they were situated. And so, I mean, that to me is that we could not have done this a hundred years ago. You know, we, if we had found this skull a hundred years ago, we could not have figured out these things about this, this individual or this organism. So go spallation and x-rays and synchrotrons. Yeah. Yes. Lasers. And go Boom. lasers. Pew, pew, pew. We love them. We love the lasers because they go pew, pew, pew. Uh-huh. Yeah. Justin, did you, did you see the story this, uh, this last week about farming, talking about uh, different ways that humans have done things? It had not, doesn't have to do with going to the trees and then leaving, but we have this idea that farming occurred basically in the Middle East, and there was the, this was the breadbasket, the region that farming uh, became something we did about 10,000 years ago. There's evidence from uh, South America and other areas of Africa and the forests that people actually started burning areas of vegetation about 50 or 60,000 years ago to make room for habitation. And from that point forward, that farming actually got started in, in forests in some regions. Huh. Yeah. So that was another thing this last week. People, we've been doing things longer than you think in some cases. Yeah, those dates keep getting pushed back and back and back. Yeah. Oh, you know what I like pushing back and back and back? The what? alarm clock in the morning. <laughs> Do I have to get up right yeah. now? Yeah. I just push that back a little farther. I don't want to wake up yet. Ugh. But while I sleep, you know, do you ever wake up and remember your dreams? Hmm. Not often. Always. Oh, but sometimes, okay. Yeah. Tom I'm hoping Justin for that dream Indeed. DVR you talked around on last week's episode. Right. To help with that. Yeah. Yeah. That, would, that, might, that also might uh, to eliminate the need for therapy. You just watch that back. <laughs> or actually, no, no. It you would just probably turn it over increase here, right? the need. <laughs> just turn it over to your therapist. Yeah. It's like, what I was thinking. Yeah. <laughs> well, instead of remembering our dreams in the morning, there is evidence that we can actually learn during certain stages of sleep. So, oh, about you know, that whole idea, oh, I'm just going to sleep on my textbook and hope yes. that I'll learn it through osmosis. osmosis. Right. Well, that's not going to happen. That's <laughs> Darn. Not, but that's what about not a book on work. tape? But a book on tape could potentially work yes. based on evidence from a new study recently published in Nature Communications. According to this study, Highly selective memory processes are active during human sleep with intertwined episodes of facilitative and suppressive plasticity. So what does this mean? They found, these researchers found, that during REM sleep, light REM sleep and full-on and, and, and full REM, REM sleep, sounds that were played during those periods of time were remembered or recalled better upon waking when they were played again. They, they did little tests to determine whether or not people recalled these sounds or could learn them more easily. And after REM sleep, it was much more easy. However, during deep non-REM sleep, during those deep sleep cycles, there's something going on in the brain that not only doesn't remember, but actually suppresses learning. So if you were to play a book on tape, tape to yourself, you would need the device that Tom talked about earlier mm. that could tell when you're in REM sleep to turn it on right. and play it when you're in REM and then turn it off again when you're out of REM sleep. Because if it, you were listening to information during non-REM sleep, it would actually be harder to learn it. Hmm. What? This this makes me worry. <laughs> this makes me worry that there's something else going on as far as like, like moving memories from short to long term or internalizing memories. And if we we start playing books on tape while we're sleeping, we mess with all the other stuff that happened during the day. Yeah, yeah well, that's true. 
memory consolidation yeah. that that is a big function for sleep and there's a, a lot of research that does show that without sleep your memory is impaired that you don't learn things um, and so we don't really know what would happen if we were to play books on tape try to learn certain information um, while we are sleeping, you know, we don't want to be like Neo in the matrix and go to sleep and learn Kung Fu during your REM sleep cycle. Don't we? <laughs> I know Kung right. Fu. Don't I do. We? I actually, maybe I do want to do that. Yeah. Um, however, this study, it didn't play verbal books on tape. It was just sound exposure. Uh. And they just used, it was sounds. So it wasn't anything specific to informational recall. Um, and so this is an implicit memory as opposed to an explicit memory. It's some, something that uh, you don't really know kind of how, where, you don't remember where and when and how you learned it, but then you just kind of know it. Which so I used to fall awesome. asleep. I used to fall asleep listening to language tapes. It sounds like maybe Did that. Help? that I, I don't know. <laughs> I'm asking Wait, you. Are there certain <laughs> words that you never can get right because they were during your non-REM sleep? Right. Yeah. Quick, Blair, speak French. Uh, <laughs> Qu'est-ce que tu veux je parle uh, maintenant? <laughs> What's your name now? <laughs> <laughs> je veux parler uh, de la nutrition. Je veux parler de la science. Est-ce que tu as soif? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> <Is that> soif? <laughs> Wait, that's French? Oh. Oui. Uh, Wait. Then it doesn't work when I try to do it. <laughs> uh, it. Obviously, it failed. I had yeah, no so, idea what any of you were saying. So the uh, this one did, <laughs> and I've fallen asleep to plenty of French movies. So I have no oh, idea. Okay. So the interesting thing here, uh, you know, is not only could this be used for you know, for us DIY brain hackers who are trying to improve their performance on stuff. You know, if you want to. Could you learn things in your sleep, actually? That is one question that this still uh, really needs to address more in detail. But the, uh, the obvious one is the learning suppression and what is going on in the neural patterns during different phases of sleep and in which parts of the brain. So in neural suppression, like basically it's taking these signals that are being heard, these sounds that came in, Whatever happened in the brain basically didn't keep the neurons at even keel. It said if it, it, it told the neurons, if you hear this sound again, you're not going to react. Just do not react. Don't get excited if you hear this sound again. Hmm. And they and so there's something actively suppressing the the neural network that responds to whatever that sound is during that deep sleep. Phase. That is the That's stage of sleep that Justin was in when he was listening to his French films. <laughs> yes. Yeah, it actually it makes sense that now that I think about it, because you, the the subtitles uh, <laughs> don't work their way in while you're sleeping. No, so they do. Doesn't work. No, they do not. <sighs> well, um, but another way that you could potentially improve your learning, not just maybe through sleep and you're and hearing things in your REM sleep, dietary restriction. Mm, brain okay. food. Not only this does sounds I, less fun. It does sound a lot less fun. I'm not excited about it. But <laughs> not only does dietary restriction potentially extend your lifespan, it also helps to improve learning. And so researchers in a PLOS Biology article this last week wanted to find out if this increase in longevity and memory improvement, if they were the result of the same mechanism or if they were separate mechanisms. Long story short, they pretty much found that they're separate mechanisms. They're regulated separately. And they found that a single amino acid metabolite, this single amino acid metabolite by the name of kynurenic acid, this is a metabolic product, product of L-tryptophan, um, is responsible for it. So uh, L-tryptophan creates, is a kynurenic acid, kynurenic acid inhibits glutamate signaling, and inhibiting glutamate signaling is not good for learning, dampens learning. So if you don't have the kynurenic acid, then you have, you don't, and then you have the learning. 
you don't have the learning. I mean, yes, yes, no, I'm getting confused. <laughs> if you don't have the kynurenic acid, the glutamate is going to be inhibited and therefore is not going to be inhibited. And then you're going to have learning that works better. Sometimes these circular. So you want to reduce the kynurenic acid. And when you're just not you eating it. as much, you're yes. not taking in as much kynurenic acid. Exactly. Especially if you're not eating as much of tryptophan, L-tryptophan containing foods. So say turkey, mm -hmm. if you specifically want to reduce or improve your learning around Thanksgiving. Wait, this explains so much about turkey. Thanksgiving dinner conversations. <laughs> it does, right? <laughs> yeah, but it's very interesting that this one metabolite improves improves the learning in, and it also has uh, effects on other asp other pathways related to, uh, to memory and, uh, and glutamate signaling. So, yeah. So Kiki. Yeah. What Blair need eat to get smarter? <laughs> <laughs> you need to eat less. Oh. Eat less <laughs> to get smarter. <laughs> This is tough, though, because a lot of people go on these crazy diets to eat less and then they end up having malnutrition problems because they're not taking in enough iodine or, or you well, know. That's, yeah, that's overall. So, I mean, if you're malnourishing yourself, then yeah. your entire system is not going to be So, if you eat less, maximum. you have to eat less across the board in proportion, right. not just cut out an entire category of food. Yeah, you know, and when you do the dietary restriction, you don't just cut it out yeah. entirely. You restrict it by... <laughs> you don't cut out all and, food. Yeah, and, no, and don't no, assume, like don't assume that you're eating too much also. You, you may not be. And you may, yes, you like, may be acting you may be doing it at this perfectly, point in time. And this is just how yes. intelligent you can be. That's <laughs> just it. That's just... <laughs> that's just, <laughs> just do that. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, so anyway, dietary restriction of L-tryptophan containing foods it could make you a little bit smarter. And look at you are what you eat, and I've never seen a really smart turkey. You may be smarter if you don't <laughs> eat. There you go. You'd be surprised, Justin. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. We've got some, they, they, they can, but if it rains, they'll drown looking up at the sky. I mean, All right, Justin, you, got, you, want, you want to tell me another story? Uh, this is actually not as big as a story as it might first seem, but four out of five doctors often agree about one form of treatment or another. The fifth doctor, Try however, oh. <laughs> the fifth doctor always recommends opioids. <laughs> oh, no. What? Well, no, it's not quite that bad, but nearly one in five family medicine physicians, one in 12 physicians overall, accepted payments from pharmaceutical companies related to opioids. This is according to a new study out of Boston Medical Center's Graken Center for Addiction Medicine. It's the first large-scale national study of industry payments involving opioids and suggests that pharmaceutical companies may have a stronger hold than previously known on how doctors prescribe the powerful drugs. So uh, this was, they used Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Service Data Researchers identified 375,255 non-research opioid-related payments to 68,177 physicians between August 2013 and December 2015, totaling over $46 million. Payments are defined as transfers of value. So this could be sending the check to the physician, uh, a reimbursement for travel, a speaking or consulting fee, education, meals, just be buying a sandwich. In fact, the average payment to physicians was $15, with most receiving at least one per year. So that doesn't sound bad. What doctor is going to be swayed by $15? That's like two sandwiches. <laughs> it's like a couple of them, right? Uh, the average payment to, was only $15. However, the top 1% of doctors collectively received more than $38 million of the $46 million. Wow. That group averaged more than $2,600 in yearly payments during the study. And so, of course, some received much, much more. Some received much, much less. And the question isn't, and they didn't direct this specifically in this to how much they were prescribing. Yeah, that I'm sure. sure is there in the data, but that's not what this is. Um, 
This is the Physician Payment Sunshine Act, Sunshine Act which was uh, passed under the Affordable Care Act in 2010, requires drug companies to report all payments to physicians in the United States. So <clears throat> previous research suggests payments from drug companies may lead to increased prescribing by doctors for marketed medications, even when payments are of a low monetary value. So that $15 sandwich might be enough to sway a doctor, I guess. Well, who's, who's, humans are, be- I mean, human behavior, <laughs> we, we are swayed by reciprocity. Mm-hmm. And this is something that psychologically works for us, tit for tat. The idea that if you do something nice for me, it could just, it, you probably use this in sales all the time. Use giving somebody, not, maybe not even giving them money, but giving them something nice. Oh, I'll do this for you. Here, you want this cup of coffee? And suddenly they feel a little bit more indebted to you. Oh, I should start doing that. <laughs> I'm not you don't get people coffee at the car dealership? <laughs> There's coffee there. I'm I mean, sure it's that's implied. Like step one. It's implied. Yeah, so the idea that even a small amount would not sway a doctor. Even a relationship. Just just knowing yeah. somebody makes you less like, well, you know what? I, 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 Joe, Joe's really good. Uh, I'll, I'll prescribe his. Because I can prescribe two different things here. They're about the same thing. I'll prescribe Joe's thing because Joe's always really nice to me. And he didn't exactly. buy me that sandwich that one time. Yeah. And then he bought me a sandwich again. That's great. <laughs> and then he bought me. Then he bought me a BMW. Right, right. Well, this is, and this is, think about it, this is $46 million just from opiate, comp- I mean, uh, pharmaceutical, re- opiate related pharmaceuticals. So this mm-hmm. is that, that $15 sandwich, and, that, and that's why I, I wish that this, like, this data was explorable and exploding all over my screen so I could click on links and everything else. It may be a $15 related to an opioid uh, conference that you spoke at or sandwich that you were given. But how many other times have they come to see you and come calling and, and on different subjects each time, but maybe, you know, each time, hey, I saw your numbers on XYZ opiate is uh, kind of up. That's excellent. Keep it up. Keep killing the pain, man. We can't have people in pain out there. Uh, and then probably giving little graphs on pain management. And if right. uh, somebody's eyes are narrowed like this, that means they're they're in more pain than they're telling you. So you should add this many pills to the next person. Who knows how we got into this mess, but there are thousands of people dying every year now from this opiate uh, right. epidemic, they're calling it now. And it's, be- it's become a health problem created by, well, created by, facilitated by physicians and drug companies. And pharmaceutical companies who are now being sued by... Mm-hmm. Mm. counties like the county I live in <laughs> for creating this problem. Yeah. Um, other problems we got, I have, I have bad news and then I'm going to end on some, some good news. Um, other bad news, other problems we have dead zones. We, think we talk about the dead zones Uh-oh. every once in a while. There's you, there's a an, an Pacific Northwest dead zone that sometimes comes up off the Oregon and California coast. Oh, you That's mean not the one not I'm, cell reception. Not cell reception dead zone. No, I'm talking about dead zones in the ocean. These are areas of low oxygen. And usually they're caused by stuff like agricultural runoff, where you have a bunch of algae or small, small critters that use up all the oxygen, and then there's nothing there for the fish. And so everything dies. And every year around this time, there's a dead zone in the Gulf of Mexico. And it goes up and down in how big it is. But this year we had a lot of rain. There was a lot of runoff from the agriculture. And this year, the researchers say uh, they couldn't even finish measuring how big it is because um, they ran out of time and they had to they had to take the boat in and they couldn't do it. And so they're they're thinking it's about 50 percent larger than normal. Mm-hmm. The average size of the dead zone over the last 31 years has been 14,037 square kilometers, according to Nancy Rabelais, a researcher at Louisiana State University. And yeah, they they couldn't measure the entire extent of this year's dead zone because it's so big. And so farming that algae out of there. Yeah, this is 
most most likely based on runoff that's coming out through the uh, Mississippi Mississippi River outlet into the Gulf of Mexico, but there are others. And um, the issue here is this is it could affect it could affect Gulf fish, fisheries mm-hmm. quite significantly. So we'll be affecting oysters and clams and the fishes. Right, and this and this fish. might be. We, we often think about when we talk about uh, chlamydia, climate change, global warming, we, we, often, we often address it as though it's going to be weather that we notice or rising sea levels. One of, the, one of the big things that's supposed to come along with this is as there's more melting of ice caps and more heat, hot and warmth of the ocean, that we get more moisture in the atmosphere. More moisture in the atmosphere means more rain. More rain means more runoff. And more runoff means more fertilizer in the waterways. More fertilizer in the waterways is exactly what this is, is the result of. And that might be where, where a lot of the world that's coastal, because that's where a lot of people live, coastal, is we're going to notice it in our coastal uh, fish estuaries. They're going to have this problem. We're going to have more and more of these dead zones. And that might be the thing that we see before Miami is is looking like Venice or Venice is looking like Atlantis. We're, we're likely to see these sorts of things progressing at an accelerated pace first. Yeah, well, it's the, you know, it's the idea we've got in uh, coral reefs. We've got uh, the the dead zones in Mm -hmm. coral reefs where they kind of seem to die off when they get burned and when it, when the water gets too hot, sometimes they come back and they're able to come back. And very often it's a yearly thing where they kind of die away because the water's hot, but then there's enough of the organisms around that it comes back every year. But maybe this happens enough times, or if it's a large enough extent, suddenly the area does not come back or it doesn't come back to the same extent. And it causes a, a uh, a slippery slope effect that leads well, us downhill. So hopefully that's not what's happening. But I don't know. It's it's self accelerating too. Uh, for instance, for instance, where you are is the the town is City of Roses. Is that also a name for Portland? It is. Okay. One of the things that they have to do in Portland to make those roses grow is they have to fertilize the heck out of everything, much heavier than you have to do in the Central Valley, even because it rains so much. The soil is drained of, of all of those plant uh, nutrients. So the more it rains, the more you have to fertilize. The more you have to fertilize, the more runoff there is because there's more rain. And then the, the, the less fishes in it. Ah! Slippery slope. This is the hey. saddest story of if you give a mouse a cookie ever. <laughs> <laughs> it is. It really, it really is. I don't like this story. If you, if you, yeah. <sighs> okay. Who wants a job? There's a couple of job offers. Oh, I know, another there. one. Yeah, yeah, there's a there's a job in China to run the world's largest telescope. <gasps> China built the world's largest radio telescope. It is a 500 meter aperture spherical telescope. It's also called the fast telescope. You know, 500 meter aperture spherical telescope. It's twice as large as the Arecibo radio telescope in Puerto Rico. And these telescopes are used to collect radio waves from sources like pulsars, black holes, aliens. I don't know. They're also used for filming movies like Contact. <laughs> but great according, backdrop. great backdrop. <laughs> yeah, uh, but according to the South China Morning Post, they're looking for somebody to run it. China doesn't have any astronomers experienced enough to run a facility of this size and complexity. So they're looking for people from the Western world. They're publishing in Western journals, trying to find astronomers that can do it. So if why, you, why don't I believe that for a second? How can that possibly be true? If you have the following, the following experience qualifications, maybe you can go work in China and make $1.2 million a year. The candidate must have at least 20 years of previous experience in the field, must have taken a leading role in large-scale radio telescope project with extensive managerial experience, and also hold a professorship or equally senior position in a world-class research institute or university. This is getting so narrow. 
getting applicants. <laughs> yeah, no, this is getting so narrow. That it, it, your also, first the applicant must, must be, be named Neil. Bob Peterson. <laughs> yes. Your first name must be Neil. Your last name must be Degrassi. And <laughs> like, wait a sec. Yeah, according to this. Just ask the man. According to this Ars Technica article, an astronomer from the giant Magellan Telescope in Chile said there are probably only about 40 or so astronomers in the entire world who would qualify for such a job. Yeah. And 40 seems high to me. Yeah. And even for $1.2 million, they don't necessarily want to go to China. Right. Good food. Yeah, it's good food. Yeah, I don't know. So anyway, you can get a job in China running the fast telescope or maybe you can get a job working for nasa as the planetary protection officer are you ready oh, to that protect sounds like the a great planet? yes do i get to choose my own customers when provided to me <laughs> well this uh this job this job requisition went out last week and a lot of people were very excited about the the men in black possibilities um, mm. however this doesn't really have anything to do with men in black really the uh, the planetary protection officer would re be responsible for uh re ensuring sterility procedures when we are going to other planets so that we don't infect other planets with our uh, own bacteria protect other also planets. in uh in protection procedures to uh isolate any foreign objects so that we don't get infected by things from other planets. Um, anyway, You're there the was a disinfectant officer, is what it sounds like. The, it is, yeah, the, the, yeah it's the highly qualified um, disinfectant officer. I'm technically in janitorial for NASA. <laughs> 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 yeah, there's a there's but an I entire also office. Feel like, I feel like this is that conversation with the with the the real guy who's really bad at talking to the the the, the suicide. Uh, he's on. He's on. He's in charge of uh, people who are going to commit suicide. He's the first responder to that, but he's really bad at it. So after you know, he's like, yeah. Well, the news about people who are committing suicide is they always jump. Jumpers always jump. You can never talk them down. You try. You go out there, but you just they're always going to jump. Like, like that's an impossible job, though. It's impossible. Let's disinfect something NASA's proven over and over again is absolutely impossible. Every clean room they've had, they've. We've discovered a new extremophile in another clean room. Look at that. So that's actually a great job. You just be like, eh, extremophiles, what are you going to do? I always make it through. I think it's a little cheerier than your example. Though. I think so. I like uh, so to it's bring no, it's some, from some movie where the guy's just like, like, and the kids are playing. He's like, hey, I'm going to put a fork in your eye if you don't quite. Like, he's just an awful guy. It's. Oh, man. And to bring it back up here at the end of the show, as we end the show, NASA got a letter from a nine-year-old named Jack who was interested in applying for the position. He said, Dear NASA, my name is Jack Davis, and I would like to apply for the planetary protection officer job. I may be nine, but I think I would be fit for the job. One of the reasons is my sister says I am an alien. <laughs> <laughs> also, I have seen almost all the space and alien movies I can see. I have also seen the show Marvel Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. and hope to see the movie Men in Black. <laughs> I hope to see it. I, yeah, I am great at video games. I am young, so I can learn to think like an alien. Sincerely, Jack okay. Davis, Guardian of the Galaxy, fourth grade. <sighs> Oh. And NASA Jack. responded. And NASA responded. NASA wrote back the director of the Planetary Science Division, the, the director, Jim Green, wrote back and said, Dear Jack, I hear you are a guardian of the galaxy and that you're interested in being a NASA planetary protection officer. That's great. Our planetary protection officer position is really cool and is very important work. It's about protecting Earth from tiny microbes when we bring back samples from the moon, asteroids, and Mars. It's also about protecting other planets and moons from our germs as we responsibly explore the solar system. We are always looking for bright future scientists and engineers to help us, so I hope you will study hard and do well in school. We hope to see you here at NASA one of these days. So you're Aww. saying there's a chance. Saying That's there's right. A chance. You're saying there's a chance. NASA, you're so cool, NASA, responding to kids' letters. I love I, it. I think that's, I mean, it, this is a great example of wonderful wow. engagement 
science communication. NASA did a wonderful job of communicating the role of the position. And I think it's an inspiring letter. I think I mm-hmm. hope it's the kind of thing that Jack is going to take with him. What if Jack's sister is aims. right? <laughs> <laughs> what if he's an alien? He's really I've got to stop properly formatting my letters to NASA. <laughs> <laughs> Write it with your left hand. <laughs> just, yeah, write it with my left hand and do it in pencil. Right. Yeah, yeah, do it and then um, tell them you're nine and in fourth grade. They might. Yeah, do it on that really large ruled paper. This is how I have. Work. I have a four year old and a uh, and a and a fifth grader. Maybe I could just work through them as proxy. Yeah, yeah you definitely. As your scribes. That's right. Yeah. Just get them to transcribe things for you and then sign their names. Or you could just get them to write what they'd like to NASA. write. NASA. My dad would be really great with the job. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my goodness. All right, you guys. I think we've done it. We've made it to yeah. the end of another show. Thank you, Tom, for joining oh, thank us you this guys. evening. A That's pleasure as always. And my only disappointment in ever being on This Week in Science is now I've already heard the episode. Yes. Oh, that's <laughs> it's sweet. always weird to go back and listen to yourself. So yeah, at two and a quarter speed. <laughs> <laughs> I might have to try that, actually. <laughs> oh, my goodness. And everyone out there, everyone in the chat room, Fada and Brandon and Identity4 and everyone else who helps us out on Twist. Thank you so much. Thank you for joining us this evening. Thank you for being a part of the show. And to our patrons, I would like to say thank you. To Paul Disney, G. Burton Lattermore, John Ratnaswamy, Richard Onimus, Byron Lee, E.O., Kevin Parachan, Jacqueline Boyster, Tyrone Fong, Andy Gro, Keith Corsell, Jake Jones, Gerald Sorrells, Chris Clark, Richard, Charlene Henry, Brian Hedrick, John Gridley, Stephen Bickle, Kevin Rails, Back, Ulysses Adkins, Dave Fraudel, James Randall, Bob Calder, Mark Mazaros, Ed Dyer, Trainer 84, Layla, Marshall Clark, Larry Garcia, Randy Mazuka, Tony Steele, Gerald Donyago, Steve DeBell, Louis Smith, Paul Harden, Kyle Washington, Greg Guthman, Time Jumper 319, XB, Daryl Lambert, Harun Sarang, Alex Wilson, Jason Schneiderman, Dave Neighbor, Jason Dozier, Matthew Litwin, Eric Knapp, Jason Roberts, Richard Porter, Rodney, David Wiley, Albert Aston, Sir Frank Adelic, Christopher Rappin, Dana Pearson, Paul Stanton, David, Brendan Minish, Dale Bryant, Todd Northcutt, Arlene Moss, Bill Kersey, Ben Rothick, Darwin Hannon, Rudy Garcia, Felix Alvarez, Brian Hone, Orly Radio, Brian Condren, Mark, Nathan Greco, Hexator, Mitch Neves, Flying Out, John Crocker, Christopher Dreyer, Artie Amshuwada, Dave Wilkinson, Steve Mashinsky, Rick Ramis, Gary Swinsburg, D- Phil Nadeau, Braxton Howard, Sal Good Sam, Matt Sutter, Emma Grenier, Philip Shane, James Dobson, Kurt Larson, Stefan Insama, Honey Moss, Mountain Sloth, Jim Drapode, Jason Olds, James Alec Doty, Alumilama, Joe Wheeler, Dougal Campbell, Craig Porter, Adam Mishkan, Aaron Luth, and Marjorie, David Silmary, Tyler Harrison and Columbo Ahmed. Thank you for all your support on Patreon. And if you are interested in supporting us, you can find inter- information at patreon.com slash this week in science. Remember, you can help us out simply by telling your friends about Twist. It's so easy. And on next week's show, we're going to be back once again, broadcasting live online on Wednesday evening at 8 p.m. Pacific time on twist.org slash live. You can also watch there and join our chat room. It's a fun group of people. We had some new people in there tonight, probably following Tom Merritt over here. I hope you come back again next week. It was great having you in the chat room. But don't worry if you can't make it live because our past episodes can be found at twist.org slash YouTube and just at twist.org or facebook.com slash This Week in Science. Thank you for enjoying the show. Twist is also available as a podcast. Just Google This Week in Science in your iTunes directory, or if you have a mobile-type device, you can look for Twist number four, Droid, App, and Android Marketplace, or simply This Week in Science in anything Apple Marketplace-y. For more information on anything you've heard here today, show notes will be available on our website. That's at www.twist.org, where you can also make comments and start conversations with the hosts. And other listeners. Or you can contact us directly. Email Kirsten at Kirsten at ThisWeekInScience.com, Justin at TwistMinion at Gmail.com, or Blair at BlairBaz at Twist.org. Just be sure to put Twist, T-W-I-S, somewhere in the subject line, or your email will be spam-filtered into oblivion. You can also hit us up on the Twitter where we are, at TwistScience, at Dr. Kiki, at Jackson Fly, and at Blair's Menagerie. We love your feedback. If there's a topic you would like us to cover or address, a suggestion for an interview, a haiku that comes to you in the night, please let us know. 
We'll be back here next week, and we hope you'll join us again for more great science news. And if you've learned anything from the show, remember... It's all in your head. This Week in Science. This Week in Science. This Week in Science. This week in science, it's the end of the world. So I'm setting up shop, got my banner unfurled. It says the scientist is in, I'm gonna sell my advice. Show them how to stop the robots with a simple device. I'll reverse global warming with a wave of my hand. And all it'll cost you is a couple of grand. Cause this week's science is coming your way. So everybody listen to what I say. I use the scientific method for all that it's worth. And I'll broadcast my opinion all over the earth. Cause it's this week in science. This week in science. This week in science. 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 This week in science. This week in science. This week in science. 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 I've got one disclaimer and it shouldn't be news. That what I say may not represent your views. But I've done the calculations and I've got a plan. If you listen to the science, you may just yet understand. That we're not trying to threaten your philosophy. We're just trying to save the world. And this week in science is coming your way So everybody listen to everything we say And if you use our method instead of rolling a die We may rid the world of toxoplasma Gandhi, I, 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 I. Cause it's this week in science This week in science This week in science Science, 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 science. This week in science This week in science this week in science, 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 science. I've got a laundry list of items I want to address. From stopping global hunger to dredging Loch Ness. I'm trying to promote more rational thought And I'll try to answer any question you've got So how can I ever see the changes I seek When I can only set up shop one hour a week This week in science is coming your way You better just listen to what we say And if you've learned anything from the words that we said Then please just remember it's all in your head this week in science, this week in science, this week in science, 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 this week in science, this week in science, this week in science, 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 this week in 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 science.